I know what you're thinking. Is this the booth, drafting the circuits, three-way theater or the Kevin Jackson show? Well, to tell you the truth in all this excitement, I kinda lost track myself here on Hoobazoo.com. So, do you feel lucky, punk? Oscar Mike Radio, come in, come in Oscar Mike Radio. Sinista One, this is Oscar Mike. I have Ulima Charlie over. Folks, this is Travis with Oscar Mike Radio. Today is Thursday, June 22nd, 2017. This is episode 49. That's right, 49 of Oscar Mike Radio. Welcome to the show. And as always, I'll begin with the question of the week. And the question of the week is, is, is we've kind of heard this one before, but it's expressed this way this week is, what, what can I do to advocate for veterans? I want to do something. And everybody seems to be doing something. What can I do? What, what will I do, you know, to... If, if what I do has value, what should I do? And all I can say is, one, thank you for your interest in helping veterans in our military... The need is always going to be there in some form or fashion. I would say if you live in a state like mine, to go to your town's local veteran service officer and talk to them about possible need and where you can assist, whether it's you know helping a, a older veteran you know with home maintenance or collecting food for somebody who needs it, maybe a, a, a guy just got out of the military in that town, because, let me back up here a little bit, every every city in the state of Massachusetts has a veteran service officer assigned to that town to assist with veterans uh, from any service with their needs. So these are trained by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to do this job to make sure that veterans are being taken care of and getting the benefits and services they have earned. Not many states have this kind of setup, so I'll get to that in a second. But you can start there because I'm a big advocate for starting locally to assist versus going with a larger organization. You know, you're not ever really sure where your money goes, but if you can start locally it'll be good it'll be good for a couple reasons one you can see your efforts help right away it's not like you go somewhere and do something you're not really sure what happens later when you think about it two you're going to make a local impact on the community by helping that veteran you've helped your community and and three you're going to get your hands dirty if you are you're going to roll up your sleeves and be able to see that veteran get that help right away and a lot of times if you go to a big org or a big event you can get lost in the shuffle and that's not going to happen if you start locally now if you do not live in a state like mine that has a veteran service officer for every city and you want to help uh, then I would tell you to go to your you know, local or regional VA, Veterans Administration Hospital, 
and become a volunteer. There's a process, but that's good. You can also go to and find a VFW, American Legion, um, and vets, disabled American veterans, DAV, even the local Marine Corps League. Um, you don't have to have served to offer help at one of their events or one of their outreach programs. Uh, I can tell you that we would be happy to have you at ours. So there is a lot you can do. It doesn't matter you know, what you have for a professional or personal background. If you have a true desire to help and you're sincere and authentic about it, you can get plugged in somewhere. So I hope that answers the question. And thank you for listening. So now we will move on to the word of the week. And I wanted to kind of talk about um, the USS Fitzgerald, which was struck by a cargo container ship and was badly damaged. Seven sailors lost their lives. And I I don't know much about uh, how this all went down. There's still information trickling in. I, I didn't I never in the Marine Corps yet that was my branch of service. I can tell you that I um, I never uh, went on a float. The only ship I went on in my Marine Corps service was the USS John Paul Jones. It was a missile destroyer uh, in its own way it was similar to what we did with Hawk but you know they were all shipbound missiles and it was very very cool. But uh, I never actually was stationed on a ship for any length of time ever. And one of the things about being in the Navy in this day and age is, you know, unlike World War II and World War I and to some extent the Korean War, you, you know, the, the Navy is considered one of the safer branches to go into because you're not really a a frontline troop you're not really in harm's way you don't have to be worried about getting you know mortar fire or artillery fire or sniped you're out there in the ocean but I think what happened last week underscores the very real fact that you know our sailors do a very dangerous and complex job daily and when things go wrong, it goes wrong in a, in a big way. That being said, um, there was a lot of talk about how the, the water compartments worked on this ship to keep the ship afloat and how terrible it was that seven sailors died. And again, I, I have no point of reference. I, I've been on a couple of Navy ships, uh, both you know, when I was in active duty and, you know, not active duty. And they're, they're big, huge hunks of steel. It's like kind of hard to imagine that anything could hurt these, these ships, these naval ships that are in the sea. But obviously, you know, this container ship collided with this, um, the USS Fitzgerald and caused major damage to it. So it is my understanding when these ships are built and designed that there are watertight compartments and they're designed this way to limit the loss of buoyancy and is to prevent uh, you know critical infrastructure on the ship you know the engine room boiler room well it's not really a boiler room anymore but the engine room other parts of the ship from flooding because unlike wood, steel sinks. And when the pumps cannot keep up with the rate of water flowing in through a, a, a crack or a, a compromised uh, superstructure, uh, it will sink. So what is done is there are compartments built that are designed to be closed off, if you will, shut down in the event that 
you know, you have water coming at a rate where the pumps cannot keep up with it. And if you're not out of one of those areas and there's flooding going on and the water compartment is closed, you are, are going to die. It's, it's really that simple. And you have, from my understanding, the challenge of being on your station and trying to save the ship, but also the aspect that if you can't get out, you, you are going to die. If, if that door closes and you are not on the other side, you, you will die. It, it's really that simple. And I, I couldn't imagine that. I, I don't think I I really internalized what that meant until I started reading about the timeline of the events. And I guess the thing that really strikes me is because of, of, of the, the crew's training, the way the ship was designed, it's, it's kind of amazing that more people didn't die. But still... I, I guess one of the things that I'm trying to struggle through here in the last couple of days preparing for this episode and doing this is, and I'm going to try to follow up with it at a later episode when the, the real story comes out, is how do two ships that big in the big Pacific Ocean hit each other? You know, how is that possible? What happens you know, two two airplanes colliding is kind of hard to imagine, but that's happened. But two ships. You know, did anybody get killed on the on the cargo ship? I'm not really sure. But I think I just want to underscore for my own personal edification. I really, honestly, have no greater point I'm trying to make with this story or pearls of wisdom I'm trying to impart. Uh, it's kind of like a couple other things that have happened uh, over the course of, of doing this podcast where, you know, I'm not really trying to teach or provide information. I'm just trying to, you know, work it out in my mind by doing this podcast. And I, and I, I can't get my you know, head around how this happened. I, I can't get my head around how we're in peacetime. We weren't in a combat zone, and still this container ship, which, you know, if you've ever seen these things, now these things are huge. Those are big, big boats in the middle of the ocean designed to carry a lot of freight at not what you would consider a very high speed, but they're designed to do that. But I'm trying to get my head around how those two objects were in the same place at the same time and how this happened. Was it negligence on the Fitzgerald crew's part? Was it an equipment failure? Was it radar failing? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, even back in the days of, of you know, wooden ships, you had a lookout with a telescope to kind of make sure that that didn't happen. Because those ships didn't have watertight compartments. You know, if enough water came in, they were going down. They weren't built like they were today. So, I, I just have a lot of questions. I'm not really sure how this all goes on. It kind of woke me up to the fact that, you know, you, you kind of think, you know, what what's the danger of serving on a ship? It's this big ship. They have hospitals. They have communications, they have redundant systems, they have life preservation systems, lifeboats, life rafts, you know, you can land helicopters on them, you can, you know, land an Osprey on them, that's the vertical uh, tilt rotor aircraft that the Marine Corps has. In other words, you know, it, it's not like it was in our grandpa's uh, Navy in World War II. Whether you're in the U.S. or another country, these are pretty sophisticated machines now and, and again uh, to you all I, I, I am struggling to understand what happened I'm uh, struggling to understand 
you know, who's at fault here. But the other story is, you know, seven, seven people lost their lives. And I don't know if we can adequately ever say if that was um, avoidable. Was it just a freak accident or was this something that could have been avoided either through train or equipment? I don't know. I, I will definitely look at following up on this once the all the information comes out. But, you know, some people lost their lives. And... I think that's the real story here. And again, I'm I'm kind of struggling to to articulate this. It's just, I'm thinking about this on on a family level as one, I have children who are looking to possibly join the military to, you know, people I know who are getting out, people I know who are retiring. You know, nothing's guaranteed. And those people got up and, you know, were on their watch, did their job. And, you know, maybe because they did their job, they were able to shut those wartime compartments and thus save that ship from further harm and distress. I don't think we'll ever know. And if we do, I'll talk about it. But um, I just feel for the family. I feel for those involved. And, you know, this is kind of my way to say, hey, you know, you you won't be forgotten on this podcast. I I won't forget about what you sacrifice. When I say you, I mean their families, uh, their their mothers, their fathers, their wives if they were married, husbands if they were married, boyfriends, girlfriends, children. So, again, this is my way uh, of trying to make sense of it all. I, I, I don't understand this. I don't have the answers. I don't have the whys. I'm not even sure what, what the ship was doing, where it was, when it was. But the fact of the matter is a terrible accident happened, and we have uh, this to deal with. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens as a result. So, you know, that is my word of the week as it is and I will be back on with more once um, I know what's going on okay we're moving on from the word to the complaint department and they got a doozy this week they are both trying to understand how the US military spent uh, $28 million, that's right, that's right, $28 million on uniforms for Afghan soldiers that aren't cutting the mustard. Uh, They're both just like, really? Really? How, how does this happen? I mean, how hard is it to get this right? But yeah, uh, the, the pattern and the material is not holding up as long as they thought it would. And so therefore, uh, it looks like it's going to be easier to scrap the entire line of clothing than it is to try to, you know, fix what's already there. Like, it's so bad that they can't even deal with it. That they, they, they don't want to even try. And they're writing it off as a loss. Now, for everybody who served and know how much, you know, uh, your utilities, your camis, your BDUs cost, $28 million is a, a lot of uniforms. I don't even know. I can't even imagine how many soldiers you could actually clothe with that and does that include their their full uniform for that uh set in other words i'm talking about the boots the socks the you know underwear the skivvies the t-shirt or is it just just the trouser bottoms and the blouse top 
because if it's just the blouse top and the trouser bottoms, that is a lot of material wasted. And what happens with the stuff they can't use? I mean, what's going on here? I just absolutely confounded them. They were they were they were all just just really in a tizzy. So that is their complaint of the week. They're not happy. So they're letting you know they're not happy. But again, if they're not happy, then they're happy. So thanks guys for weighing in. And now I want to talk about um, my good friends from Justice for Huey. Justice for Huey is about the Pitbull emotional support dog that was killed in April by his Army veteran owner. Her significant other was serving in Korea. He was deployed and she was a veteran and out of the Army. And again, tied Huey to a tree and her current boyfriend and her proceeded to shoot him in cold blood. And Mason and Heidi, who brought about the Facebook group Justice for Huey, you can check them out there. I'll have the link in the blog post. Have been following this pretty closely and advocating not just for Huey, but for emotional support animals and guide dogs everywhere and other animals. They have uh, decals you can buy that go for Sophie's House, which is about uh, taking animals and train them to be emotional support animals. They have t-shirts. I've got one. It's very nice. And they have been doing this advocacy through their cell phones and Facebook page. And it's pretty cool. They got like almost 4,000 followers. I'd like to see that number uh, increase and not let this story die down, which is why I'm talking about it now. June 27th, next week. There is a court date for the boyfriend for his first hearing about what they're going to do about him. And Justice for Huey is trying to get the word out that if you are in the, I think it's the Littleton, North Carolina area, you need to go to the courthouse and check it out. And I will have all the details there for um, everyone to see. And why is this important to me? Why is this important to you or should be important to you? It's because more and more we are finding out that animals can assist with and in some cases help heal veterans suffering from PTSD or other kinds of traumatic brain injury. If you have uh, TBI, you can get help with the animal and coping with day-to-day tasks. If you have PTSD and social anxiety or any other kind of, you know, mental malady as a result of serving or what you saw, that animal can help guide, not guide you, that's the right word, but they can help buffer that. They can, they can be a support system for you right there that will never, they'll never judge you or, you know, criticize you for how you feel. They are there for you. And it's a very powerful thing to see. And I've, I've met some people who have benefited from uh, dogs and horses. And when you see the veteran working with the animal and the animal servicing the veteran, it, it really changes your perspective on animals. And I'll say it again, I am not what you would call a dog fan, but I am all about anything that can help my brothers and sisters have a better quality of life. So... I, I feel this is very important. I really think that if you are in that area that you need to check it out. You can go to the Justice for Huey Facebook page and contact them for more information or find out and read about what actually happened and why this is so important. And again, when, when I've, I've talked to Mason on Oscar Mike Radio, when you hear his story and what he did and, and how Heidi and him got together to do this, it's great. I, I've talked to... Um, Mason, I want to get Heidi on the show to talk to her, but uh, we will see. So that is it for episode 49. 
I, again, I was really conflicted about what to talk about, really conflicted about what to do or how to talk about this. And again, because there's so much I don't know, I just want to express how I feel. And how I feel is being in the military is a very dangerous job, no matter where you are or what you do for service to our country. And my heart goes out to the seven sailors who lost their lives and their families, and we honor their sacrifice, and we honor their service. So let's go into uh, the 4th of July holiday thinking about this, and once I have a better picture, I'll talk about it again. This is Travis, episode 49, Oscar Mike Radio, out. Oscar Mike Radio, over and out. Oscar Mike Radio, do you copy? Since the one actual, I have you five by five. Anchors away, my boys, anchors away. Farewell to college joys, we sail at break of day. Through our last night, a shore drink to the foe. Oscar Mike Radio is in route. Copy that, Sinister One. Coming at you from the city of champions, Brockton, Massachusetts. Come in, Oscar Mike Radio. Oscar Mike Radio. Veteran in action. On the move, on mission, always. Off we go.